Hi everyone, so my name is Jasmine and this lecture will be a little bit unorthodox because today happens to coincide with the day that the Vision Pro releases. So yeah, the first half will be just a, an overview of augmented and virtual reality and previous projects. And then the, la the latter half will be current research that sort of moves beyond what was done before. Uh, and so I entitled it From Flat to Phantasmal because I think as, as, as designers, as interaction designers, we specifically now need to think from the X, Y to the X, Y, Z coordinate. And Phantasmal is actually a nod to a very, a very good book that I would recommend by Fox Harrell, who's the head of the Center for Virtuality at MIT, called Phantasmal Media. So nod to him. And so this is the traditional taxonomy. It was actually in, in 1992 uh, by a mechanical engineering professor, ironically. And I'm sure you've all seen this, but I just want to sort of recap of the difference between virtual reality versus augmented reality and augmented virtu virtuality. Um, virtual reality is where there is an, a digital environment, digital assets. Augmented virtuality is where you are bringing something that's tangible into digital space. It's actually probably the most interesting one visually. Um, augmented reality is where you are embedding digital objects in real space and then real reality is a consensual reality that we're all we're all in right now hopefully i don't know <laughs> we can be in a simulation and this is all called mixed reality i think there's sort of a misnomer that's going on as people are referring to uh, pass through augmented reality which is rendering um, basically a, a double rendering because you're taking a video of the environment which is technically what a phone does and then um, embedding digital objects on top of that, that's being called mixed reality. But really it is passed through augmented reality according to this taxonomy, so just wanted to make that clear. Uh, yes, and so spatial computing, which Apple rebranded because before we just referred to it as AR, VR, XR, SR, some sort of prescription drug-like acronym, <laughs> um, it, it comprises a lot of different fields. Uh, and I would say that the most notable one is computer graphics, since that's the origin of the field um, in and of itself, with Tom Furness, who's, I think, now at uh, University of Washington. Of course, at, on the hardware side, it involves optics. Now we're seeing how you can add contextualization by uh, integrating AIML. Of course, we're here for HCI, but a lot of the, the underlying technology centers around games. Psychology and neuroscience is, is, is something that will become increasingly important in the next five to ten years, thinking about how people interact with these devices specifically. I think Meta had done some precursor work with Horizons, but I think now there's a, probably a more garnered interest, and so that's going to be a, a very lucrative and, um, and needed uh, field of study. And of course, sensors, which is how we are able to perceive our environment. And so a lot of people ask me, and I think anybody should ask this question, is, okay, well, how did you get into AR, VR? And so actually, in undergrad, I, it's very strange, but in undergrad, I was, I was studying chemistry because I wanted to be a perfumer. So really, I wanted to be a perfumer. So I was, I was double majoring in chemistry and French. Um, please don't ask me. Please do, not, please do not ask me to speak French, especially if you're Parisian, because they're very critical of, 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 of the intonation. Um, but when I took this class... I was amazed by this because I think the way that we perceive colors, we perceive color as additive, but this is the briggs rocha reaction, which is a redox reaction where the concentration of iodine changes. And those of you that are bioengineers or in the life, uh, the life sciences are aware of this reaction. And so it sort of just, uh, I think it challenged my perception of what color is. And so I remember asking my professor, okay, how do I actually understand what's going on? Because how does this change from a dark blue color to a clear color? Because that, that, that completely ruins my perception of what I, I thought color was. And he's like, well, to answer that, you need to actually take quantum physics to really understand. So then I switched my major to physics because I really wanted to understand. Um, I, and I actually t ended up adding on um, an electrical engineering degree because I found it fascinating for similar reasons. Um, it's fascinating. We'll get into that if you have questions later. Um, but yeah, I think that this interaction changed my, the nature of perception for me, and I wanted to know why, because it, it just made the natural world seem more interesting. And then you find out that the reason why the colors change is basically because uh, in transition metals, there's d orbitals, and the way that light interacts with those d orbitals is why it, it reflects color. So completely different than the visible light spectrum that we're accustomed to. And, I think it sort of set the foundation of me questioning the nature of what reality is in and of itself. 
And so kind of extending on that chemistry metaphor, uh, another question that gets asked is, okay, well, I've seen AR. AR has been around uh, since the 80s. And why hasn't it caught traction? Yeah, because a lot of people ask that question. And so for me, I, I kind of made an activation energy chart, if you will. So activation energy is the energy that's needed for a chemical reaction. And, but for me, it's the energy needed for people to actually care about the technology uh, and to, to have a retention in the, in the experiences. So a lot of what happens is, I don't know if you've, you've downloaded AR apps. So how many of you have downloaded AR apps, specifically mobile ones or, or Quest apps on the Quest store? Especially with uh, phone-based AR apps, what happens is that onboarding is very difficult because a lot of branded experience, they'll present a QR code, you scan that QR code, and then that QR code takes you to either the App Store or the Play Store. So by the time you've already had to you know, navigate throughout those three screens, you're tired and you're not even interested in the experience anymore. And so onboarding is actually probably the key issue. And when I say onboarding, I mean the initial... The, the initial um, I guess scanning or starting of the app versus uh, two basically understanding the different controls in an, exp in, a, in an experience. And I think that's where a lot of people have fallen off because they'll get into a VR experience or an AR experience, not intuitively understand the controls, and then they drop off. And so I think that is, that's the problem. And so for me, I think that there are headsets, but I think it's important to note that 85, 80, 84 point whatever percent of the world's population owns a smartphone. And so a lot of times we can use that as a segue to get people into, into uh, exploring these mixed reality technologies. Um, and it's a more accessible way of exploring these technologies. And so the way that I see how a phone actually can interact with these mixed reality experiences is in terms of three different ways. So as a window, a scanner, and a controller. And so in the subsequent slides, I will show examples of each, because there are many examples of each. And I thought about, you know, what are the three use cases for mobile AR? And this is kind of what was converged on. So I don't know if you've seen any of these. Um, so I also gave reference to who, who made them. Let me play this one as well. And so as a window, it's basically a portal into another digital realm. A window can also be looking at, at, at uh, different scales. It can be looking at different, like different, uh, I guess you would say, layers. Uh, there's a lot of biology simulations that sort of take advantage of this. And then this last one can also uh, be for visualization as well into things that we cannot readily perceive, like audio. Okay, so the second one Ooh, let me. The second one, which is a scanner, um, is also a, a very apt use of a mobile phone. Uh, and so now there's Luma Labs. I had replaced that with something else. But what you can do is you can just scan the phone, and that's how use the phone as a scanner, and that's how you're able to perceive um, the environment. Um, and I think the most, I think this is the most obvious one because that's how the depth API and all these APIs work in the first place. But I think you can actually use it as Land Labs did in, in this bottom corner as an actual object scanner. And that was something that was done at Unity, which I will explain later. And the other one that's very interesting is using a phone as a controller, right? Because the Vision Pro doesn't have a controller. Uh, as we know, but I think people are just so used to the, the mental model interaction of a, of a phone. So using the phone as a proxy to a controller, I think, will be very useful in the present. And, Qual and just to, to note, Qualcomm has actually uh, implemented this sort of controller paradigm on their Snapdragon framework, so I would go and look at that. Yeah, and so speaking of scanner, uh, I guess... The most used work that I've ever implemented and done uh, was at Google working on the Depth API. Um, so I wasn't originally supposed to work on it, but what happened is that, you know, a lot of a lot of AR VR expertise is understaffed. So they needed someone who is familiar with Unity, familiar with AR VR. And I was like, I'm definitely the person for the uh, for the task, and so I helped the uh, the Google research team. Uh, in implementing the Depth API. And so the Depth API, again, provides um, a scene understanding of the environment uh, via parallax motion as opposed to the iPhone, which uses LiDAR scanning. And so, it, again, it makes it accessible to every Android device so you don't have to buy, you know, the, the $1,000 iPhone to get that same, uh, the same augmented reality experiences. 
And so this was something that um, was a depth API experience. I want to note that this doesn't show occlusion uh, or collision because that was one of the prime features of the depth API, uh, which if you've looked at filters like at Snapchat, Snap or Spark, it uses the depth API as well. Um, but one thing that was interesting is a lot of times when people are authoring an AR, it's very difficult. There was a Minecraft AR experience that was deprecated after maybe a year and a half because people get fatigued having to place objects individually. So then we wanted to sort of make an open source experience that was like, okay, if people wanted to level edit an augmented reality quickly, how can they do that? And then the answer is like, you can make, you know, a path of clones in familiar shapes, like, you know, like in vector programs. So if I wanted a, a, a ring of mushrooms, you can just make the ring. If I wanted a free form uh, ring of clones of objects, I can do that. And so it, it, it expedites the process. Um, and that's open sourced. Um, so I would look at that. So one thing, this is implemented, but these were just sort of the mock-ups, is that I think a lot of, uh, when people think of AI, they immediately associate it with LLMs now, right? But I think object detection, especially for AR, VR, will be extremely important um, if we're talking about uh, contextualizing and adding information. And so one of my favorite little mini experiments that I did was you, you're scanning objects in the room, um, so book, for instance, and then what it does is it has, it pulls from a database of, of books and it basically finds a quote in a book that contains the object, right? So with this one, I think it's pulling from Alice in Wonderland and since it detected that there was tea, it then pulls a quote from Alice in Wonderland. Um, so it kind of just makes, makes things more fun and, and, and today people don't really like to read, so it kind of, <laughs> kind of forces people to look at literary quotes that they normally wouldn't have looked at. <laughs> And then this is the, the research that's current. Uh, the research is called Speaking the World into Existence. I did not have any say in what it was called because I would, I would give that honor to uh, Jaron Lanier who is one of the pioneers of virtual reality, actually came up with the term virtual reality um, in the 80s with his lab. And the Speaking the World into Existence is obviously a nod to uh, the act of creation, right? So almost every story, you know, let, let there be light, um, it's also in definitely in African, Chinese, most mythologies, the world is, sp is spoken, right? Because speaking is like an uh, incantation. But also when you speak, there's a, a level of agency that's expected, which you don't really get with LLMs if you've played around with LLMs. <laughs> and so this was the first paper, uh, was, which was called Step Towards Prompt-Based Creation of Virtual Worlds. And there's Jaren and another person that I work with, Andy. And base, essentially what we did was we sort of experimented and prototype where are large language models useful, where are they not mixing deterministic and non-deterministic components, because essentially hallucination is not game design, because then the LLM is designing the experience for you. But if, if you, lucid dreaming means that I have 100% control, the machine hallucinating means that it has control and I'm prompting it. And I've showed this, this, this slide before <laughs> to some people. But I think a lot of people also wonder, OK, where does this data come from? Why is this so difficult to do specifically in the context of virtual and augmented reality, which are built on game engines? And a lot of that comes down to where the data is being pulled from. So most of the code that's being pulled is from GitHub, which should not be a surprise, which is op open source code. And so you'll see things where people are happy, like, oh, look, I made Pong in JavaScript. I hope you did, because there's about 90K repositories of Pong, so it's just replicate. Or, oh, I made Breakout. The thing is, if the game has a level of craftsmanship and detail, that really still can't be achieved with generative AI alone. You still need bespoke assets. You still need uh, the technical artists. You still need a team to implement that. But I think there was a, a cycle maybe a few months ago where people were under the impression that they can create full-fledged games uh, of their design using generative AI alone. And so one thing that we found that was good to use for generative, generative AI, and it's a very simple call too, is how many of you have worked with 3D assets before? 
Yeah, so you know that 3D assets are frustrating, especially if you're if you're trying to receive them from the artist. So I'll ask for a teddy bear, and then I get the teddy bear, it's two meters tall, but it needs to be in real world scale. So one thing that we found that is a good use case of generative AI is just to do a call to, to chat GPT, which was called Codex, you know, it changes every, every week it seems what it's called, but Codex at the time of, okay, if I'm importing an apple, and I know it's apple because it's been tagged by the artist, then how big how how big is an apple in real world scale? And then it's able to import that directly into Unity or Unreal, taking into account their coordinate systems. So, and I'll give an example. This is in black and white here. Oh, here we go. So I typed in orca whale, which is redundant, but <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> And so then it has to produce the orca world to scale. And you're like, ah, and then if you look on that hand side, you're like, what's going on? But then if you zoom out, you see that <laughs> he's actually nested in the whale. So he's Jonah. So again, making those biblical references. <laughs> and then another thing that we've done is just uh, a holodeck sort of experience or uh, toy, a toy world experience, which is something that um, a team I had worked with had, had called it. I thought it was a really interesting name which is how to position objects properly in, in space. And so, you know, you, have a, you would already have a repository of assets, but then you could tell it, okay, I want a couch, I want books here, I want an apple on top of a table, I want a couch like in this corner. Um, and, I, and then also if you look, I think the most, oh, I don't have a pointer, but if you look, you can see the little two images on the wall. Those two images on the wall were actually generated with Dolly. Yeah, so the thing is you can have the frame and then nested in the frame, those are actually, that's actually Dolly that's integrated into, um, into Unity in the frames. And so exploring those sort of interaction things. So the most interesting thing I think that was, that was done is we wanted to pay homage to Pong, which technically was the first game that was done in oscilloscope, right, up in Berkeley. And we developed a multiplayer Pong game where, where there were, there were uh, like deterministic parts. So I was able to say change paddle, it knew to prompt the paddle. If I said place something, which you can see in the video, it would place it directly where I looked. Change ball, it would change the, the projectile or the ball. If I paused, the entire game would pause, continue, it continued, pull, pull. And it's also, if, you, if you're familiar with put this or put that there by Chris Schmant, very similar um, interaction paradigm to that. But if you look at this one, this is still my favorite one. I show this one all the time, which is um, if you change your hand to a knife and then you change the ball to salmon and then look what happens. Oh, no, look what happens when you collide. And then also there was lag. And then also notice how it's orthogonal. We fixed that. <laughs> and then it changes to sushi because it knows it knows. Uh, well, it doesn't know, but that's, that's sort of what, if you ever played the game Little Alchemy, right? Which I would say is sort of an ontology engine. So it, it's able to say, okay, if I get water and fire, what do I get, right? Or if I get um, just any two objects, like if I do like a banana and apple, usually it'll produce smoothie. But I think exploring these sorts of uh, combinatorial dynamics are interesting because it's not just about, um, the gameplay, it's also you're discovering what data is actually in the model, right? And I think because that's where you're like, okay, what, what, what sort of data is this grounded in? Because another one that I always reference is I remember after I had combined the banana and the apple and it made a smoothie, the smoothie had been bouncing towards me. I was like, okay, let me change my paddle to a mango. So then I had mango and smoothie. And for me, for my, my frame of reference, I really thought it was going to do mango lossy. It did not do mango lossy. It did smoothie again. So I said, man, it doesn't even know what mango lossy is. And so then I had to keep adding things. I was like, okay, if I add cardamom, will it somehow know? Just like any sort. And it did know. It, it then knew with the additional input. Um, but it's clearly grounded in, uh, English, in English, and I think that was just further proof of that. So I think just thinking of games as ontology engines instead of thinking of them in very defined terms. Um, because I think people think that game, game design, game discourse, and, and game pedagogy is at odds with HCI or computer science pedagogy. And because I've sort of navigated um, the different spaces and have met different people, a lot of people are thinking along the same lines. There just doesn't seem to be cross-pollination. 
Uh, so when, when this year there were, we were reviewing Kai papers and there was a sort of game track, and one thing that I had noticed, and I'm saying this because you, are, you all are, most of you are students, is that a lot of the work that was done, that was presented, had actually been done before, but not by people that had, had submitted to ACM SIG Kai conferences, but had submitted to games conferences like IEEE COG or these other conferences. So this is just to say, uh, to remember to be cognizant of other research. And like when you do a literary, literary review with ARVR, make sure that you're looking at things outside of the conferences that you're applying to. Yeah, and so essentially how this was done, it's not special anymore. It was special about uh, maybe a few months ago. <laughs> but now that, you know, what is it, Pocket Pals and Pop Pal World and all, and all those companies are attempting this, it's, it's, the novelty has been diluted. But essentially in, integrating uh, OpenAI's models into Game Engine, or not just OpenAI, any sort of LLM model into Game Engine is, is frustrating if you want it to run runtime because... Uh, C Sharp is not a scripted language, right? It's an interpreted language. So, so it's easier to use, say, Babylon JS to inter if you want to use Babylon JS to produce generative AI VR experiences. That's easy because it's trained on more data. I think for C Sharp, GitHub has about like maybe seven percent C Sharp code. Unity also is clearly a derivative of C Sharp using the MonoDevelop framework. And so to even do this, you have to put a compiler in Unity called the, we use the Roslyn compiler to even get all this to, to run runtime. And so that was just um, what this was about. And now it's open source. So if you go on uh, my GitHub, you could just fork it. But before it was more under wraps. And, oh, and, and again, returning to my roots, one thing that I'm working on now because uh, my roots is I'm very, I, I still am interested in physics and the and dynamics and, and just how the natural world works. Because I think what's happened now is people now can generate static objects, right? We are at a point now with uh, nerfs and everything where you can just present a scene and it's hyper-realistic because this field has moved super fast. But one thing that's still missing is how objects interact with each other, like the interstitial interactions between objects. And that's something that I'm... I'm passionate about. And so one thing I was doing was I was thinking, okay, how do I get uh, chat GPT to understand what gum is in a game engine? Like, how do I get it to understand? There are, so there are actually a lot of databases, material science databases, where you see, where, where there's a lot of different variables like elasticity, um, you know, thermal properties, mechanical properties. So sort of bringing that data, which really hasn't been used in generative AI, and then pulling that in so that we can sort of replicate that. Because I feel like once you actually are able to replicate physics of objects, that's when you actually are able to get that lucid dreaming. Because now essentially a lot of the, the I guess, the work that you see is, is just static objects, right? There's no, there, there, there's no dynamism. And then even when there is a... Even when there is a character model that's animated, again, it doesn't really have any semantic understanding of what's around it, so it's not like it's able to do anything. Um, and so, yeah, this is something that I'm very passionate about, and I would love to answer questions about this. And, yeah, relatively short, but that's it. All right, we've got some time for questions, discussion, thoughts. Um, can you say a little bit more about the psychology slash neural in five to ten years? Yeah, there's actually a lot. So what do you want to know about specifically? Because there's the, there's, I would say, the social VR side of things. There's the actual, like, biometric integrations, right, that, like, control labs, at Fate, which is a, a subsidiary of Meta is doing. So just curious which angle. Both? Are Both? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that social VR, uh, yeah, social VR is definitely going to be more explored. I think, again, I think the problem is that a lot of the research has been done in industry instead of in academia. And one of my qualms that I have with the industry is I think that academia, since you're you're all in one, you're on one campus, so you're able to have cross discipline collaboration that doesn't happen as much as you would like to in tech companies and so a lot of those things about ethics and psychology and, and, and human to human interaction were lost and what happens when when that what happens when you don't take into consideration that is the environments become toxic 
they're not pleasant to be in. You get 13 year olds who are using expletives and that's something that, that does have to be explored. I can say that there are people I know who specialize in this and they're actually both at Apple for whatever that's worth. Um, so I think that work is being done there. Meta is doing that work. And then there's also a lot of work that you can pull from Second Life, right? Just Second Life, the original Second Life, that actually shows how uh, people interact and how they perceive their identity and how they, um, and almost like how people, uh, I guess it's like how people, like how people not only just uh, choose avatars, but why they choose the avatars they choose. Um, like, is it an idealized version of them? Are they, you know, because the way that people interact with gaming technologies in, is very different, right? Like, some people are purely in, in an experience just to communicate with others. You would call that a social experiment or a social user. The second, the second group is people who are more explorers, right? So it's the people who play games and they try to exploit flaws in a gaming map, which I've done on Left 4 Dead 2, which might reveal my age, but anyway. <laughs> And then also uh, there's uh, achievers, so people who like uh, gaining something from playing the game, um, whether that's like collecting coins and just the leaderboard and showing their friends. And then the, I think the, the fourth one is like achievers, socializers. Oh, people who like uh, FPS games. I almost forgot. <laughs> people, killers. They're called killers. In the, in the, in the, in the Bartle uh, model of games, that's actually what, what it's called. So... Um, so yeah, there, there has been research uh, done into this. I mean, a lot of research of that vein is being done here, right? In the communications department. Uh, that's a lot of Fox's research. I would say in terms of the, the bio research uh, with neuroscience, there's a company called OpenBCI, which was uh, an alum of the Media Lab. Connor had worked on that. Uh, Facebook bought Control Labs, because Control Labs was, was its own um, company in New York, but now it's a subsidiary. And yeah, there's a lot of work on essentially the work that I'm doing, but instead of voice being the input, you would actually just have thoughts be the input. There's a lot of work on that. Um, so I would look into that. It's control labs, control. I would look, I would, uh, look just reference control labs for the papers. Uh, I was curious when you spoke about controllers, I think with the new you know, Apple Vision Pro, we see this sort of move towards you know, just using your hands and using without having any controllers out there. But I found some aspects of it to be unnatural, like for example, typing on a keyboard with your fingers. So how do you think sort of input is gonna evolve? Do you think it's gonna be all speech? Do you think there's a better way to get about it? Yeah, no, it can't be all speech because uh, one of the, the great things about tech is that there's like a diversity of people that work in tech who don't have English as a primary language and that's an impediment to voice only systems. I will say that there are a lot of uh, teams that are working on haptic gloves because haptics are important and that's why that keyboard experience on the Vision Pro doesn't feel, you know, doesn't feel real. And I, I find it a little bit interesting because even the older VR systems in the 90s, like you saw at NASA or Jaren's lab, they had haptic gloves, but I think in this last iteration of AR VR, for some reason people weren't, they weren't prioritizing haptics, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, you mentioned that physics of object can lead to lucid dreaming. What does that exactly mean? Yeah, I think, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try to give an example. So if I just say I want a, give me give me the, an, any object. Like a apple? Oh, oh man, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, see, this actually can be done, but fine. Okay, so if I say that I want an apple rendered, I can render an apple, but it's not necessarily about objects in the scene. It's about how objects are able to sort of interact with other objects in the scene, right? Because that, that's basically the nature of what, what physics are. It's, it's forces, right? It's like based on the four fundamental forces. So like the distance, distance between me and you, me and you, me and you. And so it's about the, that interplay, right? And so what ha what's happening now is that, again, I could say render an apple, and Luma Labs can do that quite well. But if I say something that even uses colloquialisms like, hey, render an apple and, and drop it Newton style, actually, it probably could figure that out. You would, you would essentially expect something that's like y, you know, some Y height and then to drop in unity. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. And that's a simple interaction. But even looking at interactions that are playing with shaders and material properties like the stretching and the elasticity and the, yeah. I'm curious um, about the 
interaction between industry and research coming from academia. There's so much really good research, like you give examples and avatars, a lot of the work that's coming out of Fox's group. Um, how do you feel like, as someone who's bo in both worlds, how do you feel like industry is or is not prioritizing some of that research on yeah, social implications of um, spatial computing? Yeah, I think it's a bilateral thing, right? I was just telling that uh, I think what happened is that when when money was poured into Oculus in the early days, what happens is that a lot of research obviously is grant-based, but that can't necessarily compete with the millions of funding that was poured in. So my path, again, isn't really traditional, and it's tumultuous, because when I was in grad school, and I'm just being honest, I think that the HCI field didn't even really want to acknowledge that AR, VR was, was like up and coming. Um, and this wasn't that long ago either. And so for me, I was like, okay, well, I could make the most impact in industry. But I would say an issue that with industry of why this research matters, industry doesn't value historicity in the same way that academia does, right? In academia, we, we, you have to cite people, right? You have to because you build on, off, on top of other people's work. Whereas I think the uh, industrial incentives are very almost like hyper individualist, right? And I think that's kind of led to people reinventing what others had done before. And the thing is sometimes it's not done uh, in malice, it's like kind of done in negligence and just like not doing a proper literary review because that's not part of the culture of industry. And that's kind of where all of that research, they could have looked into Fox's research, they could have looked into uh, Dr. Balinson's research, but they, they just overlooked it because uh, the culture, the internal culture doesn't necessarily prioritize um, what, it, what, it, what has been done before. However, there are research divisions within those companies that have a very strong um, bilateral relationship with universities, and I think that's where you get more of the dialogue around ethics. And, yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to mention University of Maryland many years ago worked with Jobs on the next machine, and they were doing physics simulations. So I don't know if that old information would be a good source for you know, uh, the physics of reality. Um, but it was pretty impressive work. And that was University of Maryland American Association of Physics Teachers were using it. Yeah. With the yeah. next. Yeah, that's good enough. Long ago. <laughs> mm. Hey, yeah. I'm curious whether you have any thoughts on. It seems like a lot of the work right now is, is starting to, as they aim to bear some similitude of like, like making an accurate simulation of reality. Yeah. Like, have you seen any other research that is like maybe like tied to other goals, or like I'm curious like whether you think like that's like a worthy goal, or like what you see is like the reason for that that goal. Like, like people want to tie that goal. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I I agree with you that like mapping the reality that we already share into a virtual space maybe uh, is not the best use of of. of Reality. I mean, also, there's the whole thing of things being hyper-realistic versus being stylized, right? And, and I think it, it, it was recently when people found out, oh, stylized things actually are better. Because if something's hyper-realistic, but it doesn't quite match reality, then you get Uncanny Valley. Um, but I think a lot of it is just uh, the, the lab actually does a lot of crosswork with a physics lab. That's internal in Microsoft. So I think just replicating certain phenomena is interesting. And then also, it, shader programming is very difficult. And so just facilitating that um, is really the goal. Um, but I agree with you that I think the, the beauty of the technology is that it does not need to map into reality. It doesn't even need to have gravity, right? Like, we don't need to ground everything in, um, in like, the physics of this world. But I think it's just being done to, to uh, expedite certain processes. But yeah, that's a good comment. I just want to pull the thread on some some of the implications you were you were pushing toward. You talked about you know Dolly filling in the art on the wall and so on. Some of the major issues in in creation of virtual environments are like assets and animations, right? And I'm wondering, do you think that those walls are like, going to topple? Like, do you think that the kinds of techniques you, you were discussing and, and that you see on the horizon might enable these, these systems to generate all sorts of assets that are not from a predefined library or to, like, to create animations in a more open-ended way? Or do you think we're still going to be constrained to the 15 things that, you know, I got off of, you know, the, the library that I happen to bring in or, you know, the basketball will just sort of 
bounce in place, like without rotating these kinds of things. Yeah, I think now. So that's what we're looking into now. Uh, so there's there's like a there's a two part thing. So one of them is that a lot of the initial experiments were done with point E. Point E is not as, as well known, but it's basically I can give. It's also made by OpenAI. I can uh, prompt a sort of object, and it will give me a point cloud representation of that object. Mm -hmm. So we tested it with that as well. Um, obviously, uh, Dream Fusion by Google already mitigates that situation because they already have um, mo like gener generated models. I think a lot of times the reason why you pull from like a, a particular folder is because like a client, for instance, wants a, wants these these certain bespoke assets in a certain style. Mm -hmm. And I think right now the agency that generative AI allows like isn't good enough, but I think it could get there like very soon. It's just in the meantime, I think it was more about uh, reorienting objects. Um, but the generation of the objects is, is certainly getting better. And we're seeing that with Luma Labs, um, OpenAI, and then I don't think Google's really released Dream Fusion, but I mean, it's definitely possible um, right now. Mm -hmm. You talked about augmented virtuality a little bit and how you find a lot of promise there. I'm wondering if you can give some examples or where you see yeah. the bigger frontiers. I'm trying to find someone in the room that I saw. Okay, I don't see them. No, so so just like last week, I was at the the MIT hackathon, and I'm not the the virtual reality hackathon, and I'm not surprised that because a lot of the things that get the most eyes on them and the most interest are augmented virtual reality virtuality experiences, which is oh, what did I really wish I could show the video? I could probably find it, but they had these these cubes that were in physical reality, but then they mapped into Unity right one to one and so you were playing with the cubes they lit up when they when they uh, touched each other and there were different ways and the scale the exact scale mapped into virtual reality um, and there are some experiments I did like maybe again yuck <laughs> H maybe like seven years ago at PlayStation where they were doing the same thing they were basically using a, a drone like a physical drone and then mapping that into virtual space um, yeah, I, th I think it's interesting because it's the clear uh, fusion of like digital and tangible, whereas a lot of times you, you kind of lose, um, you, you lose a lot of people with augmented and virtual reality because it's not grounded in something physical and because there's the absence of haptics. So it's like some people need that sort of, um, you know, kinesthetic feedback or just any, anything you can touch. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but it's basically bringing tangible objects into Usually with, the, with, with either like a camera that's like uh, mirroring that in the virtual world or like using sensors and then just mapping that into Unity or Unreal or a game engine. So like uh, an application that you see for more immediate would be, for example, picking up your phone, scanning an object, but then actually experiencing it in virtuality. But anyone can basically. Yeah, I mean, and like make your own controllers or make your own assets. Yeah, a good a good idea, but I would say it's more scene based and object based, which is being used. Is me essentially like recording you guys, and then someone else is in a VR headset and can see you, can see that that that's a, that's what it's used for, for certain applications. Yeah, for remote viewing. Maybe one other. Can you pitch towards the user free energy diagram? Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So I think this is, when I've been reading reviews of you know, the new Apple headset and so on, I think they're often sort of wrestling with this question in various ways. It's like, wow, it's really good. Is it good enough to sort of be the catalyst that we need, right? And the, the, traditionally, the barriers have been things like comfort, it'll give me a headache over time, battery, um, motion sickness, all these kinds of things that feel like they can, for a lot of people, get in the way of, you know, I guess, lifting that that curve around a little bit. So I'm curious just to get your, your hot take, I guess, at some level about what would it take? I mean, obviously, you know, we don't know what pl companies are planning, or maybe, you know, Microsoft, but in general. But what do you think we, we could work on and what would it take to get this to be like, oh, a thing everyone has? So yeah. I actually do have a lot of hot takes on that. <laughs> um, well, 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 I would say that the reason why Apple is a progression in the right direction is because when you put it on, it works. And unfortunately, that wasn't the reality for many headsets. The setup itself, I mean, people were calling themselves computer scientists just for doing the setup. That's how bad it was. <laughs> um, so I think that's sort of been uh, Apple's helped push that along. 
I think, I mean, it's funny because I, I'm not like a pro, like I'm not like, ooh, I'm a pro web dev, but I do think the, I do think web, like w uh, more focus into WebXR actually helps facilitate that. Because again, the QR code issue that I have mentioned, uh, where you're looking at different screens to get to the experience, if the QR code already maps to something, right? then that's automatic, and Apple is working on that, and so is, uh, and, and Google is also working on that. So I think it's, I think web-based experiences um, and, and the onboarding, which is just like I put it on and it fits, to, it, it fits to my face, it is able to sort of activate the experience immediately. I don't need to do like 10 steps of setup and put it in developer mode and do this and do that. Um, yeah, I would say the onboarding, yeah, and then, I, and then even if we're looking into in experience, one thing I didn't mention that I should have in this, in the last, in the slide prior, was that one field that really should be taken from that isn't taken from enough until it's too late is theater. So I've learned a lot of uh, things from my colleagues that are in theater. So there's a colleague I have named Seda who she's done Broadway productions and she's an expert in spatial audio because it's also the key about users need to know where to look because when you're in VR, it's like tabula rasa. At least with AR, you're grounded in something that you're familiar with. But with VR, the user's like, where do I look? Where do I start? And the people that have the experience with navigating people to look certain places are people like you know, people that are in theater, uh, stage design, even magicians, that's their specialty, right? And actually one of the best XR designers in the space who's at Unity, he's a, he was a magician by trade, which makes sense. So yeah, I think it's, it's like user attention, which would pull from those fields. Um, it's just ease of, not, I'm not talking about like the industrial design or the weight of the headset, but just like being able to put it on and then it works. And I don't have to like, turn it on, then get a home screen, then be like, ah, how do I put it in developer mode? And then also making it web accessible, right? So that it's as, it's as easy and intuitive as um, the QR restaurant codes. That's the, that's the one good thing that did come of that event. <laughs> People know of QR codes. They're not averse to them anymore. <laughs> uh, I love the use of short video clips to communicate some of the experiences in spatial computing that are otherwise hard to communicate in words. Um, and I wanted to follow up on one particular point that you mentioned about um, serving as a Kai reviewer um, this year oh. and how you saw um, that some folks in the traditional sort of ACI community, yeah. like myself included, who perhaps don't come from a gaming background, but are working in the AR, VR, um, don't always appreciate the contributions that come out of the, the gaming world. And so I wanted to ask, what should I be attuned to, or what should people who come from a you know, non-gaming HCI background look out for or learn to appreciate in sort of the work of you know, gaming in the space? Yeah, I, I, so I actually gave a, a talk, at, it was called AIIDE, it's like an, an AI conference on games specifically, and it, again, I feel like the, the game, people that have done games as for as academic profession have sort of felt in a sense outcasted by both the, by basically the CS community at large whether that's like the NeurIPS conference the Kai conference but I think there's again there's a lot to pull from there but I like the three conference I mentioned was maybe IEEE COG um, the one I just mentioned which is AIIDE they're a very small community um, I can send references later but there are a lot of uh, game conferences that are nested under larger uh, tech tech organizations like IEEE and ACM. Yeah. Yeah, because he put something out on Facebook recently that said, hey, if your Kai paper wasn't approved, oh, yeah, I saw yeah, that. come to us, <laughs> submit your paper to us so you might check I it out. I saw that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I just find it interesting just because when you, I, I think it's the impact of when I talk to people who, who are studying games as like an academic discipline, how they're like, oh, they didn't even cite the research. And I'm like, yeah, I've seen it before. So like I would say, it's just about doing a more thorough literature review and just looking up like academic games conferences. And there's a lot to be learned there, like a lot. Because they, um, and I say this like all the time, and it's like a broken record, but I think a lot of the issue of why I felt I had to go into industry and then like come back was because just education in general doesn't prioritize spatial learning at all, right? Like we have to take verbal tests, math tests, like analy you know, anal uh, analytical things, but even on the GRE, the SAT, there's no spatial component. And so the people that intuitively, it's not intuitively because it's a, a, a learned skill that you have to build, is people who study things like architecture. 
And see, that's where my chemistry background came in handy. I almost forgot, because yes, I did take OCHEM. Yes, I did torture myself, and I took OCHEM. So even just, just understanding how molecules move in space, <laughs> understanding how molecules move. Um, and I would say even people who are, like, who are studying like mathematics get into that if you're studying things like manifolds and differential geometry. But in general, most people don't have um, the level of, I guess, training of spatial, of, of spatial reasoning, which is, yeah, that's something that, and the sad thing is there's not many courses even today in universities, because I look at them all the time just to see, oh, is someone finally going to teach a class? I'm like, no. I could probably name all of the six classes that they have. Some of them are in hardware. Some of them are in design. But I'm like, there needs to be one that's specifically in computer science. Um, and I know that a lot of computer science undergrads, like, really kind of like cower when they hear of linear algebra, but unfortunately, that is the basis of this, of this technology, essentially. So I think it's a matter of having more classes. I don't know how, how we can manage that. I mean, I, I, I taught a class um, at NYU, and it was more development-based, but I think a lot of the people just kind of want, because with me, I'm someone where like, you have to learn, right? CS students, when you're doing the assignments, it's annoying to go through each assignment, but you have to learn. And there's a lot of people in the space that don't come from computer science background, so that's something to also keep in mind. And they're used to sort of, like they like following tutorials instead of like having to sit down for five hours and then you finally finish your like data structures problem set. Not, they're not used to that, like just the debugging process where like, no, it doesn't work 95% of the time. It's the 5% of the time that makes computer science worth it. It's not the, that's part, part of the process. And if you're not already trained to do that, it's just, it's interesting to teach people where they, um, they get really stressed uh, just with the process of debugging. I'm like, yeah, that is what this field is. Um, but just being, just being mindful of that and so trying to, it made me sort of think, okay, like maybe I need to change how I, how I like teach, teach and approach the subject. So I did give some tutorials, but again, what I've learned is when you give people step-by-step -step tutorials and then, I, and then I say, okay, do it yourself, they can't do it. And then another thing I noticed is that a lot of the learning materials that we have for AR, VR, so if I was a student like, like you guys and then I typed in, okay, I want to learn AR, VR, it'll direct me to maybe the Unity Learn page, some Udemy courses, some Coursera courses, but the only, the furthest it gets is like spawning an object on a plane. That's not, that's really the furthest they all get if you've noticed, even if you go on YouTube, that's not enough. Because again, it, it matters the interaction between objects. Um, so like one interaction that I did, which I may make open source, uh, was at Google with the depth API, which had occlusion, right? So you, objects would hide behind objects in the real world. One interesting thing that we did is we took a sphere and then we like gave it different materials. You can tell I'm really into materials. And then we brought that sphere behind an object. And then if it was wood, the sound attenuated accordingly, right? If it was glass, it attenuated accordingly, right? So just things like that. And there's not a lot of um, technical, I would say technical uh, coursework or even technical direction of how to implement these things. I think a lot of it has been trapped in prototype and ideation. Um, and at least for me, I think the, the general public already has a mental model of it because I mean, we all have superhero fatigue. We've all seen it. We've all, and, so, and, and the problem is you're trying to match user expectations of things they've already seen. And that's actually the most challenging part of the field because people already know what they want to see. They're like, oh, if I hear Minority Report one more time, I don't like hearing it anymore. I'm like, also, you would probably get Carpal Tunnel by, if you do Minority Report, that sort of interaction. But again, that's the framework people have. And so there's a lot, there's a lot that... Uh, needs to be improved. And I think it actually starts with education. I really would love to see multi-layer displays come into cell phones and, you know, just mix it up more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we're like we're, we're sort of like stuck with this form factor for a little bit, but I think other some companies are playing around with different form factors. There's also things like the looking glass and then the layup pad, and those are interesting to look into. Think about safety and security for VR and AR, mm -hmm. especially with like your vision control accessory. You're using a hacker video for displaying the real so everything is digitalized. So technically, a hacker could hack into your hacks and then like basically remove like a serious desk hack, like physically in front of you, and that basically becomes like a physical hacking that those like cybersecurity things. We hacking the only with like data centers or more like digital interaction. I'm curious if you're like after hacking to like safety. 
There is. <laughs> so there's actually an organization that's called XRSI, which is XR Safety Initiative, uh, led by Kavya Perlman. And she worked at, um, why do I always forget the name of the place? The, the place that made Second Life, she worked there. Um, and so she has, a, this is like her bread and butter and her experience. There's also like another organization that's called XR Guild that's now looking into uh, ethics in that space and, and specifically in security. So I would look up XRSI.org. Yeah. Because she's definitely looking at that and she actually uh, consults with Meta and, and discusses that. So I have a question about creation versus consumption on VR, AR apps. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the issues with, I think, many headsets like MetaQuest is there are not so many number of creators for the apps, and the consumers might be. Uh, there is a limit on the number of consumers if you don't have enough apps. So yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of just it's kind of what I said with the last question, a lot of it's like education, right? Because there are a lot of, um, there are no code tools, right? That people use like no code prototyping tools like Snap and Spark AR. Um, but the problem is those experiences are trapped in those ecosystems, right? So they're not gonna end up on the Quest or they're not gonna end up on uh, whatever Apple's app store for the Vision Pro apps are, which is probably the app store. Um, and so I feel like the issue still comes down to there's not enough developers. And that's really the answer is there's not enough developers. And so, um, yeah, and like I said, I think the, the, the answer is like education. There was a part of me that was thinking of making a course, but it's just, it's a lot. I don't mind that it's a lot, but there's a part of me that's like maybe someone should make a course that goes beyond just like, you know, spawning an object on a plane, basic ray tracing. It's like, no, you need something that actually, because the funniest thing is even with ray tracing, they don't even, there, there's never, beyond of like, okay, well, how do I get the object to move? How do I even get the object to move with uh, like touch input? Like, I mean, there are tutorials and you can sort of, um, I guess, Frankenstein them together, but there's not like a clear step-by-step -step thing. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but the answer to your question is there's not enough developers. Um, and I'm very protective of the developers in the space, very, very protective because it is a lot of labor. Um, and it's not really appreciated in the same way because it's also far more complicated. I can't say order of magnitude because I don't want to be quoted on that, but I would guess it's, it's at least an order of magnitude more difficult than like traditional 2D apps where you have tools like Figma, you have tools like, um, you have tools like Sketch um, to help with, with that process. So I think it all comes back to there's no there's no uh, education in developers. And actually, if anything, I should ask you that question, which is like, what, what could I do to sort of help uh, get you interested in developing for AR, VR, right? Like if anything, the question should, like that, I kind of want to know the answers to that. So if some of you have time after, I want to know the answer to that. <laughs>